the Compromise of 1850, first crafted by uh, uh, Henry Clay of, and put, of Kentucky and pushed through Congress by Stephen Douglas of Illinois, will ease sectional tension. We'll just slap a Band-Aid on a, on a really, really big wound, uh, and the tension never really goes away. Uh, both parties endorsed the Compromise of 1850. Uh, and in 1852, um, the, the Democrats will nominate an obscure New Hampshire politician named Franklin Pierce to run against the incumbent Winfield Scott. Uh, I'm sorry, to run against Winfield Scott, the incumbent Millard Fillmore, who had only become president because Zachary Taylor had died, uh, chose not to run for re-election, which was common back then because he was seen as, as not being chosen by the people, so not really an incumbent. That's changed, of course, but that's the way it was back then. Winfield Scott, of course, had been uh, the general that had ultimately won the Mexican-American War. Both Pierce and Scott refuse to mention slavery. They just don't talk about it. This is the number one issue in the country, and both presidential candidates just ignore it. The Whigs become angry with Scott for refusing to address the issue, and, and many abandon him to support a third-party candidate, a free soiler, they call him, named John Hale. This refusal to take a stand on slavery is ultimately going to kill the Whig party altogether. That's why there's no Whig party anymore. Uh, and Pierce is going to win the election, as you can see here. Pierce, as president, doesn't talk about slavery. He acts like it doesn't exist. The Fugitive Slave Act, which was part of the Missouri Compromise, uh, I'm sorry, the Great Comprom uh, the Compromise of 1850, um, will become a huge political issue. This says that if you're in the North and somebody says that person's a runaway slave, you are obligated by law to help them capture that person. So you're, you know, a little old lady carrying home your groceries, and there's a, you know, this big, healthy, strong black guy, and somebody says, stop him, that's my slave. You're obligated by law to try to stop the black guy. Um, this is a crazy law. And, of course, the northerners began to protest it. Um, states began passing laws saying you can't export slaves, uh, which would mean you can't take free uh, slaves, even if they've run away, out of the state. Mobs will begin to show up and not help people capture slaves, but stop the apprehension of slaves. Of course, many people begin to point out, how do you know he's a slave? I mean, you just got a white guy saying, stop, that's a slave. We don't know if he's a slave or not. The South becomes enraged because this was what they were given. This was the part of the Compromise of 1850 that was their reward, right? This was the thing that was supposed to make them sign on. And now it's not even happening. And so the South is going to become uh, extremely upset about this. Slavery will further destroy Pierce's presidency. Um, young America is the movement, is, is what Pierce talked about. And young America is just a further extension of manifest destiny. We think of manifest destiny today as meaning America getting to the Pacific. But back then they thought about it as much, much more. Revolutions in 1848 uh, uh, in, 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 uh, in, in the other parts of the Americas as well as back in Europe will further spur dreams of the expansion of democracy. Um, there, there's a sense in Europe that the old order is being overthrown. Pierce will attempt to buy Cuba from Spain. Uh, the Austin Manifesto is a plan that discusses taking Cuba from Spain by force, but this plan gets leaked and so it ends up being stopped. The North is enraged by this. They call it a plot to expand slavery because Cuba is full of uh, uh, sugar plantations and Cuba will definitely be a slave state. You see the, the picture there of Uncle Sam about to eat Cuba like it's a little fish. Um, but we would have, uh, Cuba would have been American if we could have resolved the slavery issue. Hawaii asks to join the United States. Hawaii says we would like to become part of the U.S. But the annexation is blocked uh, because Hawaii wants to join as a free state. And so the South won't go along with it. Canada asked to join. We, Canada wanted to become part of the United States. This would have almost doubled, I may have more than doubled, our land mass. But of course the South says no because Canada will only join if it gets to be a free state. So our inability to resolve this free slave issue prevents America from expanding. Uh, 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 we could have taken Mexico at the end of the Mexican-American War. We could have taken Cuba. Hawaii and Canada both want to join the United States. But the expansion of America is short-circuited um, by uh, the debate over slavery um, in this country. By now, the U.S. has figured out the Great Plains are good for farming. As people are moving to the Pacific Ocean, they're traveling across the Great Plains and realizing, hey, this is good farmland. Um, as whites pour in, they begin to ask for the land to be organized into territories. Now, this violates treaties with the Native Americans. We had given them this land a long time ago, but nobody cares. Oh, the Native Americans care, but no white people care, very few. It makes the already ongoing fight over the expansion of slavery even worse, as this is more land we have to figure out if it's going to be free or slave. 
Uh, but it also creates a new fight over the railroad. Where will the railroad go? Um, there are three possible suggestions here. Out of Chicago, you see the northern route on the map here. Out of St. Louis, that's the middle one. Or down along the south, out of uh, New Orleans. Now, of course, which one you support is all about where do you live. Do you live in the north? Well, then you like Chicago. Do you live in the middle part of the country? Then you like St. Louis. Do you live in the south? Well, then you like New Orleans. It's not that hard to figure out. The Secretary of War at the time, Jefferson Davis, who will later be the president of the Confederacy, will send a, a diplomat, Gadsden, to buy the little bottom part of Arizona and uh, New Mexico there. This is called the Gadsden Purchase. Now, we spent $10 million for this chunk of desert uh, that really isn't good for anything, um, although I like it. It's pretty. Uh, why did we buy it? Well, we bought it because we wanted land south of the Rockies to put the railroad through. There's a pass there uh, that could get, us, get the railroad through the mountains. We wound up using it till much later, but that's why we buy it. Uh, think about that for a minute. We bought the entire American Southwest for $15 million at the end of the Mexican-American War in 1848. Uh, just a few years later, we spent $10 million dollars for this tiny little chunk of desert. Douglas, the Illinois senator who, if you remember, had broken apart the Compromise of 1850 and pushed it through, uh, is the most powerful man in Congress at this time. Uh, he was a short little guy, by the way. They called him the Little Giant. He wants the northern route, which makes sense because he's from Illinois and the northern route starts in Chicago. Um, and so he put, passes bills to organize what's called at the time the Nebraska Territory uh, in an attempt to civilize it, pacify the Native Americans, and clear the way for a northern railroad route. The South, of course, is paranoid, assuming this will be a new free state. So Douglas puts in a provision saying that it will be two states, Kansas in the South and Nebraska in the North, and they will vote on whether or not they will be free or slave. Now, this is important because this ends the Missouri Compromise, because if Kansas and or Nebraska can be slave, they're both above the Missouri Compromise line, and so the Missouri Compromise no longer exists. Kansas is expected to be a slave state, while Nebraska is expected to be a free state, thus preserving the balance. 